We want uh, consciously to have our lives work. We want the life, our lives to be filled with joy and pleasure and to look forward to each day. What prevents us from doing that? What is really the bottom line cause? How, do we, how, it is, how is it that your life maybe doesn't represent as much of this ecstasy as you'd like to it, have it represent right now? And I'll propose to you that what Bruce was telling you was absolute truth, and I'm just going to add a little bit to it. Whether you're living in growth and protection makes all the difference in the world. What determines that? Well, I can messages as a child versus I can't messages are one of the big ways that that determination happens. If you receive more positive input from your environment, generally your parents, for instance, and you were told that you were lovable, you were told that you could accomplish anything, you were told you were good enough, you were told that you were wonderful, then you're probably having a life that reflects that more now than anybody could imagine versus if you were told more I can't messages. You're not good enough, you'll never amount to anything, you're not smart enough, all those things that's, that many of us heard. Those go in just like experiences. Those are experiences. They're just information driven. They're parentally induced usually, reinforced by society. And so we end up with a series of experiences that either put us primarily in growth or protection from our perception of life. Turns out our childhood programming becomes our habits of perception and behavior. You get your programs early on. By about five years old, the psychologist will tell you, your personality is pretty well set. What they mean by that is, you've had enough experiences to draw conclusions about yourself, and now you're either looking at yourself through the growth or protection filters. The good news is, even if you have produced these filters and you have habits that are supporting the perceptions and the behaviors that you don't want, they are changeable. They are changeable. Habits are usually the things that bug us the most because, most because they, are, they are what they are. Habits are things that happen out of your conscious awareness. It doesn't seem like you have any control over them. You consciously try to control the habit. You say you're not going to do something, but you do it anyway. So I want to explain to you how the cycle of habituation occurs, why it occurs, and then ultimately how you can break that cycle. These cycles are really self-reinforcing, and let me see if I can explain this to you. I'm going to use the candle as a model because we talked about that earlier. If you're two years old and you're having your first encounter with fire, and it happens to be connected to a candle, and you crawl over to this fire, and it's a very interesting thing. You've not formed any opinions about candles or fire yet because you've never touched anything that was hot, and now you do for the first time. All of a sudden, you've got an experience. The experience is hurt, ouch. That shapes a perception. The candle's no longer a general thing. Now it's a thing that could create pain. You have a perception of the candle. The perception creates a belief that candles are dangerous, or at least fire is dangerous. You've got it connected to the candle, but the main thing is the fire. That perception then shapes your experience of this candle. The experience reinforces the beliefs. What happens is, the next time you see a candle, instead of crawling over to it and sticking your hand in the candle, your perception of the candle as a possible source of pain keeps you from doing that. The fact that you are not going to go over there and stick your hand in that, in that candle again, it, you'll never again have the same nebulous sort of perception. You're going to have a very specific perception of candles and you're going to watch out for it. Now whether as a child you learned about hot from sticking your hand in the fire and you got burned that way, or as you get older you have more complex experiences, you get burned in other ways. You get burned in relationships as they say. That's a very complex form of burn, but it's a burn nevertheless. And it usually leaves a mark so that when you, next time when you look at that situation, whether it's a relationship or whatever it was where you got hurt, you're going to move away from that. You're going to move into protection. And it's a self-reinforcing cycle. So some of the good cycles, like learning that fire is hot and to keep your hand out of it, is wonderful. You don't want to interrupt those cycles. But what about the cycles of self-deprecation? What about the cycles that say you're not good enough? What about the cycles that aren't very generative, that you'd like to get rid of, then it would be important to be able to break the cycles. Basically breaking the cycle amounts to rewriting the software of your mind, because then you can change the printout of your experience. As Bruce said so eloquently, it's about your perception. If you can change how you perceive the environment, essentially how you can perceive yourself in the environment, you can change the environment. You'll be treated differently the second you treat yourself differently. We're told that, you know, day in and day out by all the positive thinkers, but they stop at that part. And then what do you do? Well, there is a something you can do, but how do you do it? 
It requires two things, really, information and tools. I'm going to give you a little bit more information, and then we'll get to the tool part. And please understand that with respect to the tools and the confines of my situation tonight, which is one hour, not two days in a workshop, I'll be able to hopefully demonstrate at least one of the psyche change processes that I've developed over the years uh, so that you can get an idea of how quickly uh, a belief you may have had all of your life actually can change and how you can verify that it's different uh, as, as soon as it changes. So we'll be doing both things. Now one of the key pieces of information you need to be aware of that makes all the difference in the world is that you don't have one mind, you have two. I mean, haven't you ever tried to change your mind only to find out your mind is a mind of its own? <laughs> Bet you have. And I'll bet you, you relate to some of these things down here, the ways in which people try to do that. If you've ever promised yourself you'd get in shape, but then you didn't. Ever made a New Year's resolution you didn't keep? Ever try to quit smoking? Try to stop procrastinating? That's a favorite one. You swore you'd never get involved with another relationship, but you do. And the list goes on, and you can fill in your favorite personal one down there about what you've tried to change, and you said you wanted to change it, so there's a conscious intention, a commitment. You're a bright, energetic, committed person, but somehow it just doesn't come off. It doesn't happen, even with your intention focused in that direction. Let me give you a little rundown on how different those two minds are, because this is very important in understanding the nature of how change can take place very quickly and why it's been so difficult with the tools we've been given for the past 35 years, which are mostly positive thinking, affirmations, willpower, that sort of thing. I don't know about you, I tried them all. You know, they worked maybe 20% of the time, very frustrating, but it was best we had at the time, so people kept doing it. Just say your affirmations, just do that meditation, just do it over and over and over again. The problem was, it's, it turns out, we were mostly talking to the wrong part of the mind that's in charge of habits, in charge of the change. Look, conscious mind, it's volitional. It sets goals, judges results, and it likes to try new things. That's the one that says, hey, there's something good happening, let's go out and do it. Let's go into an environment we've never been in. Let's ride the killer roller coaster. <laughs> let's do a bungee jump, you know? It's the one that would say, hey, that's a great idea. But your subconscious mind didn't like that at all. Subconscious mind says, it's busy monitoring the operations of your body, basic things like motor functions, heart rate, digestion, and it prefers the familiar. It's the part of you that likes to play it safe. It wants to know what's going to happen in the next moment. It doesn't want something new to contend with. Its basic job is to keep you alive and safe. So why would it want to bungee jump or get on a roller coaster? It's not interested in that. So remember, volitional and habitual, two different components of you completely. The conscious mind thinks abstractly, it's conceptually based. The subconscious mind thinks literally. It sees the world through your five senses. Bruce mentioned the five senses. You're going to see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. That's the only way the subconscious mind can know reality. The conscious mind is the one that reads all those self-help books. It's the one that says, yeah, aren't we inspired? Let's go for it. It's got all of that energy about uh, what you're going to do. It thinks up all those really great ideas. But without communicating the ideas to the subconscious mind uh, adequately, you usually don't go anywhere. You get very excited. You ever been to motivational speeches? I mean, just plain, flat motivational speeches. I mean, when I was in the corporate world, boy, we just did a lot of those. And I'd go into those things, and they'd just whip you into a frenzy. I was clapping and stomping and yelling and screaming, and I was so happy. And then as soon as that motivational speaker left, so did the motivation. <laughs> if you didn't get him or her to come back, which is the point of it, of course, <laughs> come back and get that fixed, you get cranked up again. But there's a better way to do that. There's a better way to get to that place and to stay there. And it has nothing to do with motivation, actually. The conscious mind is responsible for short-term memory, the subconscious mind for long-term memory. Now, the short-term memory has a little trick to it. I don't know if you know this, but it's an interesting fact. The average length of short-term memory is about 20 seconds long, short-term memory. Now, I